with Mr. Leo. Leo will be joining us with his the first question of the day. Leo came all the way in from Seattle. <laughs> Leo is uh, part of our book club as well. We have an MBT book club that meets, and Leo is uh, one of the participants. Hi, Leo. So my question is about m how all of us experience ourselves as um, our, our identity as me. And um, so I understand what you're saying, that, that each of us is an individuated unit of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I experience myself, my experience of myself as me is partly that free will awareness unit. But I also get the impression from things you've said that that my avatar, which has a brain, even though the brain is just part of the information system, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just virtual, that it has some effect uh, on the way I think. That's the impression mm -hmm. I, I get, and I don't, but I'm not clear on what, you, what you're saying about that. Okay. And when, when we talk about trying to meditate, uh, disconnecting from the chatter, is that chatter then coming from the avatar brain Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to disconnect from it. I guess that's my question, if you can okay. understand. Sure. Um, the connection between the avatar and the consciousness is that the avatar sets constraints on what the consciousness can do with that avatar. Okay. So if the, if the avatar and consciousness together, you know, live on brownies and donuts and Coca-Cola, that's going to affect, according to the rule set, that's going to affect what the consciousness can do with that avatar. Because the biology is representing the rule set. So if you don't take care of your body, that means you're not only that you won't maybe move very well, but you won't think very well either. And if you don't think very well, according to the biology of the rule set, then your avatar is going to have to deal, I mean the avatar, the consciousness is gonna to have to deal with an avatar that's fuzzy minded because the biology of the rule set now will cause those constraints on what the avatar can do. So that's how the that's how that that interplay goes. So yes, what you do with your avatar, the choices you make, see the consciousness making choices to eat donuts and Coca-Cola for dinner, those choices will then affect what the consciousness can do with that avatar. So becoming aware of facts like that is an important thing for the consciousness to become aware of, because then the consciousness has a, a, a bigger reality in, in which it can work. It has a bigger scope. So as, as you, you know, as you grow up, and there's a, there's a couple of interactions here, it works both ways. Um, so you have the body affecting the consciousness in the way I just described. But you also have the consciousness affecting the body. It doesn't work just one way. So as the consciousness lets go of fear and belief and ego, the body starts to change itself in order to support that better. And there was some research done a long time ago that I've mentioned occasionally before. I don't mention it that often, it's a little gruesome. But it had to do with, with uh, sheep being moral. Scientists noticed that if there was a lamb that was still suckling but it lost its mother, another lamb would take it in and let it suckle with its own lambs, basically support it. And of course, biologists look at that and said, that's wrong. Every critter is supposed to be trying to maximize getting their own genetic material, you know, forwarded in the system. Yet this 
Sheep is sharing resources with something that's not part of her genetic. You know, it's getting some competitor's genetics forwarded in the system. So the gruesome part is what do scientists do when they find an anomaly like that? Well, they kill the sheep. And they look at the brain to see what's going on. And they see, well, yeah, look, the sheep has this little lobe on the brain where moral choice is made. You know, humans have that same thing. Therefore, in their mind, the sheep's brain did a, you know, biology sometimes just does new things. It, it uh, created this lobe, and that lobe in the brain is what enabled the sheep to be moral. It's just the opposite. Sheep are doing the same thing we're doing. They're making choices, and by those choices, they evolve or de-evolve the quality of their consciousness. Those sheep just evolved the quality of their consciousness to where they cared about lambs, whether it was getting their you know, genetics or not, wasn't as important as helping that helpless lamb. So they, gen they created morality, and because of that, their brain grew a lobe to support that activity. You see, so it goes both ways. So as you grow up, your biology actually changes to support that growth. Your brain changes, your I don't know, hormones and doctrinal level, chemicals you make, all sorts of things will change to support that and make it easier. And it works the opposite way. You uh, have an accident, you have brain damage, then the, the rule set of biology will say that now you can't remember, you slur your speech, and you walk with a limp because that's the portions of the, of the virtual brain that got damaged. And now your consciousness has to, wor has to work with an avatar that slurs its speech and you know, can't remember. The good news is, is that whatever situation you're in, you can learn from it. You can learn from anything. Every situation creates new choices, different choices. So you lose your memory and slur your speech, a whole new set of choices comes in to you to make you as consciousness to make. So whatever happens to us, our consciousness can still learn and grow. So does that help set those, those two things apart and how they, they change each other? Yeah, I'm still, I'm still curious though, it's just a curiosity about <coughs> if there's still f some kind of functioning that's a, a, a processing going on in the avatar as opposed to my consciousness. Like, for example, speech, a language. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is knowing English something that my consciousness does, or is that something my, the avatar brain does? The avatar processes nothing, stores nothing. It's just a virtual brain. But it does represent the constraints of the rule set according to biology. Biology is the rule set. So it provides constraints. That's all it does. It's your, it's your consciousness is where all the processing and uh, where all the memory and the rest of that come from. The brain itself is only there to represent constraints of the rule set. Nothing, nothing more. It's really just so an avatar. It's just, just an avatar. Okay. That's all it is. Okay. So, so getting back to the question, <coughs> when, I, when I meditate, um, I have the, the issue of, you know, thoughts coming in and what, what we often call chatter. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I try to visualize the idea of, you talk about point consciousness, which is just disconnecting from the mm -hmm. data stream. So if the data stream, if, so where's the chatter then? Is the chatter in my consciousness? Yes. So Chatter's disconnecting from the data stream doesn't really disconnect me from the chatter. Well, what you have to do is, you know, it does just, okay. It's a language is a difficult thing, you know. You Meditating get it. Is too. 
<laughs> yeah, you get a you have a data stream, and that data stream comes from the computer, but data comes to you from three possible sources. The computer is one. That's what creates the data stream. Another one is some other IUOC, some other consciousness, because all consciousness are netted. And the third one is that you produce data because you're consciousness. So you can create information too. So those are your three sources. And none of those sources comes with tags that say, this is from the larger consciousness system. This is part of your data stream in this virtual reality. And this one is from your imagination. And this one is some, some other IUOC that's thinking about you right now. No tags. You get it all. A jumble. It's all mushed together. So the, the noise you get is coming from yourself. You are a consciousness creating that noise. And the reason that you create that noise is that your attention is not focused. Your mind is jumping here and there and, you know, what happened last night and what's going to happen tomorrow and why is Susie so upset with me and, you know, you got all this stuff going on in your head all the time. And oh, even, even about your body, oh, my stomach feels a little this way, my toe hurts, you know, you got all this stuff going on. And if your consciousness is constantly flying around, grabbing bits and pieces of stuff that are just all over, then that's the noise. So the consciousness has to learn to stop making all that noise to quiet itself. So that's, uh, that's where the noise comes from. It's internal to the consciousness. You can't blame that on the avatar. <laughs> That's the consciousness itself. And of course, the, the reason that the consciousness seems to be so limited, that's what we call the free will awareness unit, as you said, is that comes from an individuated unit of consciousness. Now, those of you who are beginners, you got an individuated unit of consciousness, and what happens is that it partitions off a piece of itself that I call the free will awareness unit. And it's that piece of itself is what logs on to the avatar. But that piece of itself comes with zero intellectual part, no memory, no remembering the last game that was played. It just comes with its quality. It comes with the quality that the, that the IUOC has, cre you know, has created for itself with its good choices, but that's it. So when it logs on, it's 100% immersed. It doesn't take lunch breaks or bathroom breaks or anything. It's logged on. And the only experience it has, which is now part of in its memory and its intellect, is the experience it gets from that avatar's senses that it gets from the data stream. So as far as the free will awareness unit goes, it is that avatar. That's the sum total of its experience. It knows nothing else. So it fully believes that it's the avatar because that's all the experience. It doesn't have any experience that it's anything else. So that's kind of why you get, you get noise, why it's so totally connected to the avatar is because, you know, that's its whole world. It has no other, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the bigger picture to where it can step back and say, oh, yeah, I'm really an IUOC. I'm a bigger thing than this. It has to learn all that. It has to figure all that out. That doesn't come with it. Okay. So, yeah, that's, okay. yeah, the noise is self-created. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Good. things are scary. Hi Tom, my name's William. 
And uh, I have a question uh, about uh, entropy. Um, you should know that I'm not a scientist, uh, so uh, you can probably uh, answer in any way, and I'll believe you. Uh, but the, 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 the basic question is, uh, the idea of entropy is that uh, lowering entropy uh, creates more order, or mm -hmm. I should say creating more order uh, it can be measured by lower entropy. Right. And, uh, and that's uh, you know, part of what we are attempting to do in <coughs> this reality is to create more order. Uh, and that, but entropy is uh, a sort of a linear process. And I'm wondering what is the role of dynamic systems theory, in particular chaos theory, in creating order. Because what chaos theory shows uh, that uh, from massive disorder and, and really unknown initial conditions, all of a sudden something can quickly come to a mm -hmm. very specific higher order. Yes. Uh, and we see that in, um, in for example, in biology, in, in ecosystems, in the weather, mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, you know, men, in economics, right. and, and possibly actually going to a higher state of consciousness is represented by um, you know, a, a chaotic mind all of a sudden you know, flipping into, let's say, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. so, so what is the relationship between entropy as a measure of disorder and chaos theory, which spontaneously creates order. Okay. There's not really a direct connection with empathy, I mean with entropy. The entropy, of course, does, does get chaotic and get very high and then collapses into something that is uh, lower entropy. That's the nature of the chaos when you keep driving a you know, like a fluid through a tube or something, it'll get to the point where it's chaotic and then there'll be these little regions of placidness amongst the chaos. And the reason for that, the reason that you have that is because of the way that our virtual reality is constructed. It really comes out of the nature of the, of the construction methodology of virtual reality. The virtual reality is constructed by taking a, a random draw from the probability distribution of all the possibilities, okay? Sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you ask me a very technical question for somebody who's not technical. <clears throat> Anyhow, so let's say, to try to make it a little easier, let's say that you're going to make a measurement of something. Okay, now making a measurement just means you're going to look at it, you're gonna take in data. You're gonna demand that the system send you a data stream that tells you about that. So making a measurement may be opening your refrigerator door after you've been gone for a month and you're just returning home. That's making a measurement. And there's a lot of uncertainty because you haven't been there for a month and you're not quite sure what you left behind. So you open that door and there's uncertainty. Here's what happens. There are maybe, you know, 10 or 20 different things that you might find in there that have probability of being there because sometimes you buy those things and, and uh, whatever. So there's all of these possibilities that could be there. And some of those possibilities are more probable than others. So we'll take all the possibilities and their probabilities so now we have a probability distribution of all the possibilities. So this is axis down here on the x-axis is possibility one, two, three, four, five, and each one has a peak on probability of being so high or so low. So that's what the distribution of, that's the probability distribution of the possibilities. Now, when you open that door, random draw is taken, and that's what you see. That's what's inside that refrigerator. That's like a collapse of the wave function. Yes. You see, that, like a collapse of a wave function, not only works for little tiny things, like the scientists would tell you, it works for everything. 
That's the way all measurements are done, whether it's in your refrigerator or whether it's done uh, with a tiny particle. That's how our reality is rendered. So you take an astrophysicist and he's got the biggest, best, newest telescope and he looks through it and he's going to see a part of the universe that nobody's seen before. So there's a couple of rules. One, what he sees has to be consistent with history. Same with your refrigerator. You're not going to open the refrigerator and find, you know, an exotic belly dancer inside or something. <laughs> That's inconsistent with history. Wouldn't chaos theory think that that's a well, possibility? Well, there are possibilities, and I'll, I'll get back to the chaos theory in a second. So anyway, that's the way things are done. So that astrophysicist, he looks there, and it has to be consistent with history, and it has to be consistent with the rule set. You can't see something that the rule set doesn't support. So within those things, here's the set of possibilities that were within those constraints. So when it's a probability distribution, that random draw means the things that are more likely to have the higher probability are more likely to be drawn. It's not just randomness from the possibilities. It's randomness from the probability distribution. So the things with more probability get drawn. So what happens in chaos theory is that if you break the problem down into, let's say, little tiny volumes. So we're going to look at this flow of a liquid through a tube, which is a good chaos thing, mm -hmm. simple. And we're going to crank the velocity that we're forcing this liquid through. So early on, there's what's called laminar flow, and there's no turbulence. It just flows through the pipe. A little tiny bit of turbulence on the edge, but not much. Then the velocity that we're forcing this liquid through gets more and more. Those little tiny things on the edges start to get to be big things on the edges. And then they go totally nuts as you force this velocity up. And then what you'll find is where they were going totally chaotic, little cells of quietness will get in there. And what's going on is when you take that random draw, as that, as that velocity of the fluid goes up, there's more possibilities of where each one of these little tiny chunks of that flow could be because now there's forces that can move those things around where there weren't before. So the number of possibilities goes up dramatically. As the number of possibilities and, and their probability goes up, in the beginning, you have very discrete uh, possibilities, just a few here and a few there around where those little tiny things used to be. But as it gets faster and faster and it gets into chaos mode, you have so many possibilities that most of them are about the same probability because so much is driving everything every which way. There's so much interaction that it actually makes the whole thing to where you've got now a thousand possibilities, but they all have about the same probability. And when you have that, that generates it all of them are about equal. You no longer have that. So now every time you draw something, it's got about an equal probability of doing it. There aren't any big differences in the probability of whether it's going fast or slow or something. So they're all going about the same, which creates that little island of peacefulness. Because the velocity of the particles now doesn't matter. So that's why you get the little thing of peacefulness, isn't there? Because though you have a lot of possibilities, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what your random draws. You're getting the same thing. So that sameness comes out as little islands of calmness within the chaos. But then let's say you keep driving it up more. Well, then you'll, you will go through a similar cycle again. So the reason that chaos works the way it works is because the system makes measurements in terms of random draws from probability distributions. And it self-organizes. It self-organizes. And it self-organizes because the more chaotic it gets, the more the same it looks. The more sameness it has, and that sameness then gets reflected in islands of quiet. 
So, so order is actually built into the system. It's built into the rule set, like the possibility of order. Yes. Well, that's kind of cool. So we just, uh, just I, I mean, uh, uh, so from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, things are just going to happen because there's already order there. And we are going to go to low entropy just by the nature of, of all the chaotic systems of like all of our interactions as human beings. Yes, that's true. But only, you know, maybe I should put it that way. Theoretically, that is right. But whether that takes a billion years or only a few hundred thousand years depends on whether we make good choices or not. So you could say theoretically, you know, you have, you read this thing, it says theoretically, you know, 12 monkeys punching keys randomly on a typewriter, 10 to the minus 25, they will produce the works of Shakespeare. So, but that's theoretical, right? Well, this is like that. You know, you can say, well, yeah, if nobody does anything, we'll eventually get there. Yeah, in a theoretical sense, but it may be one times 10 to the minus, you know, 25, that that'll happen. Mm -hmm. But if we focus on it and try to grow up and become love, then it'll happen soon. That drives it. So that's the thing. Yes, it's a, it's a theoretical possibility that just by randomness we'll all suddenly become love. But it's not a high probability. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Good. That was the most technical, non-technical question. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of my aha moments is when I realized the origin of, of chaos theory. Hello. kind of an art sliding yeah, into that chair, like, isn't it? I'm not the most <coughs> graceful. Um, you, earlier you said that you had experienced, or if I heard this right, changing your consciousness changed your reality. And something I play with as far as um, visualization and wanting to change my outer reality. But have you ever got to experience it with all your neat stuff that you do, where it's been more like evident, like you went in and changed it and your actual reality changed. Can you tell us a neat story or tell me a neat story of where you went in there and you were wowed by your actual changing it, not months down the road, but more immediate? Can you, well, the idea is that you can modify future probability with your intent. Okay, okay so the future is not a done deal. The future could be all sorts of things. But the future has a lot of possibilities. And those possibilities all have probabilities, like we just said. And you can modify those probabilities with your intent. So if there's five things that could happen, but there's one of them that you'd really, really like to have happen, by putting your intent to that one being the one that happens, you can make those other four kind of shrink in probability and that one grow in probability. So the, the likelihood of you having that one that you want gets bigger. Now in a, in a thing where everything's about, there's a lot of uncertainty and everything's about the same level of probability, it's real easy to modify those. But it's not always easy. If there's something that's you know, 10,000 to 1 to happen. It's really not likely to happen. And you may be the master wizard of all time. And you may change it from 100,000 to 1 to just 100 to 1. Wow, three orders of magnitude. You're really strong. It's still not likely to happen. You see? So, so some things you can, you can affect very clearly and very immediately. And other things you're just not going to affect even though you give it your best shot. So that's the way that works. Now some things can be rather easy if there's lots of uncertainty. So let's say you live, a, you work in a very congested area 
and it's almost impossible to find a parking place any closer than a, you know, a quarter of a mile. So as you start out on your way to work, say it's a 15 minute drive to get there, you start putting your intent on getting a parking space. But it's, the timing has to be precise because somebody's gonna have to back out of a space just as you get to that space because if they back out of that space five seconds earlier, somebody else is going to get into it before you get there. So you work on this. You see this image of somebody backing out just as you get there. The red lights come on for the brake lights, and out they come, and you get it. Because there's so much randomness in that, you can get your probability up to about 80% of getting a parking space every time you go to work, when normally it would be about 20%. And when you, when you go and you do, like, <coughs> you said you've experienced other forms of reality. When mm -hmm. you're in it, has it ever been where you've gone in there and you can adjust for a really quick response? Like, can you? Oh, yes. This reality, it takes a lot of. Tell me. This, <coughs> this reality takes a lot of effort and a lot of, of uh, focus to change probability. When you are out of this reality, let's say in an out-of-body reality, you can change things like that very quickly. You're out there and you'd say, oh, sure would like to have a cherry vanilla ice cream cone now. Poof, there it is. It's right in your hand. You can lick it. It's delicious. You can create things. You can create monsters that scare yourself. If you're negative and you're fearful and you go out of body and you kind of have this scary, this out of body thing, what if I don't come back? What if I meet some terrible thing or whatever? You will create the terrible things. You will create in that realm, you create very quickly with very little intentional effort. So yeah, sometimes it's just very instant. Here, it's got this big wool set that you've got to deal with. So it's a little harder to do that here. So it depends on the amount of uncertainty as to what you can change, what you can't change, and how much effort. And that's how we heal people. We use our minds to heal people. All we're doing is modifying a future probability that they'll be healthier and less sick. So if they've got a lot of uncertainty about what's wrong with them, it's much easier to make that lump be benign when somebody finally looks at it because there's a lot of uncertainty. If you wait until somebody looks at it and identifies it, now it takes a lot more effort because the probabilities just <laughs> went like that when it got looked at, you see. So the uncertainty is the key. You can only change things within the natural uncertainty of those things. So not knowing, uh, knowing what I want to feel, but not knowing how I get it leaves more uncertainty for me to be able to have it. <laughs> like if I want abundance of finances, mm -hmm. if, if I don't know how they're going to come, but I just focus on having them, then it leaves more play for... Well, it's not that you, it's, you don't get the uncertainty because you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it. The uncertainty has to be natural to the event, but let's say... Out in the world, there is circumstances by which you could become wealthy. Mm -hmm. Maybe you win the lottery. Yeah. You know, maybe um, you know your your wealthy Uncle Fred. You know, gets run over by a cement truck and he leaves everything to you. Okay. You know, there there may be all these possibilities, mm -hmm. and you may really like your Uncle Fred, but if he's one of the possibilities, then him getting run over by a, a cement truck gets more likely. Okay. You see as well, because there's all these possibilities and you're putting your own energy, still working? Yeah, you're putting your own energy into a result. Those possibilities will start to change because of your intent, which means Uncle Fred's, you know, <laughs> life expectancy <laughs> may go down okay. as a result okay. of that. Okay. Because you're not putting it into a specific thing. Now, if you say, oh, I want to win the lottery. Well, okay, you can do that. 
But now remember, you've got an odds of what's your probability of winning the lottery? One in, you know, 500,000, one in two million? Well, now you've got that. Well, it's going to take a lot to change that, you see. But maybe there's 10 or 20 ways that you could end up wealthy. You're just changing the probabilities of those things. And if all you want is wealth, then Uncle Fred passing is one of the players. Okay. If you say, well, I want wealth, but don't mess with Uncle Fred, you know, <laughs> somebody else, but not my Uncle Fred, then your Uncle Fred will be left out of it. Okay. You see? So it's your intent is what, is what drives it. Okay. But the in, now I, I guess I should say another thing, too. All intents are not equal. You will have a lot more power in your intent if you can get rid of the noise. So that means you're a good meditator and you can stay in point consciousness for as long as you need to be there to do this. If you have very tight focus, so you know what you want very precisely, it's not, well, I'd like to be sort of better off. That would be nice. That's very nebulous. So that puts out kind of a weak thing because it could mean all sorts of things. You could be better off because you lose your job because you'll get a better one. So you may end up losing your job because you said you wanted to be better off. There's always unintended consequences. So it's a game one needs to play very cautiously. So if you have a you know, if you have a very more specific, not that I want to be better off, but that I want at least, you know, $100,000 in my checking account, well, that's very specific. And uh, that may actually happen. And then a week later, after you spend half of it, the bank will say, oh, we made a mistake. You need to give us that money back. So yeah. Powerful stuff. <laughs> so, anyway, it's your mind. You have to control it. So, if your mind, what I'm saying is that if your focus is jumping around, then you're not very strong. If you've got noise, you're not very strong. If you only do it, if you only set that intent once or twice, it's not going to be very strong. You have to keep an intent over time, focused without noise. Now you're about as strong as you're going to be. So it has a lot to do with you and your intent and the quality of your thought. Also, there's one other variable in it, and that is that if what you're doing is high entropy, it's counterproductive to what the system's all about. If what you're doing is going to increase your entropy, it's going to puff up your ego, it's going to, you know, it's going to interplay with your fear, then the system is not too keen on working with you with that. So you're just on your own. And you can do whatever you do. The system isn't going to stop you, probably, unless it just thinks that that's necessary. But mostly it'll just let you be on your own. But if, you're, if you're in, your intention is one that's going to lower entropy, that's on your path to growth, it's on your way of helping others, of becoming love, the system will go out of its way to help you get that. It will work with you. So one of the more important things, and I'll mention this later when we're doing uh, healing and, and the remote viewing, one of the most important things you can do is develop a good working relationship with the larger consciousness system. If you do that, then you'll find that everything else gets easier. You're welcome. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. So I've actually been uh, listening to you since 2009. I just came in from Toronto, and it's really nice to meet you in person. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, the first one concerns uh, mental health issues. Why are they caused, and is there a way we can reverse and fix them? Uh, my second question is related to morality. So let's say there are 10 people in a country and there's a mayor who does something that really hurts two people but really helps eight others. Mm -hmm. Would that constitute something moral or how do we, I mean, I guess I'm trying to ask you, does utilitarianism 
fits into your idea of morality? Yeah. Okay, first question. Uh, well, most of them in the opposite order. Morality. Morality is making the choice. The moral choice is the choice that lowers entropy in both the system and for the individual. But the system is the, is the bigger player. You want the lower entropy of the system. Now often, if you, if you lower your own entropy, that does lower the entropy of the system because you're a part of the system. So you're a piece of that. But sometimes you may have choices that will raise a little entropy over here, but lower entropy over there. In that case, the best choice is the one that has the best long-term entropy reduction. That's your best choice. So if you have something where you sacrifice A and B in order to save or enable C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and the long-term effect of that is going to be a much lower entropy than if you did it the other way around, you saved A and B and sacrificed through P, then your choice would be the lower entropy for the system, even though that may be higher entropy for A and B. So it's a system thing. So it's not just about you, it's about everybody. When I say the system, that's everybody involved, and not in the short term, but long term. Now, how do you make moral choices when you don't have your handy little entropy meter that can tell you what the entropy effects are going to be long term? See, that's a problem. Well, the way you handle that is that you do your due diligence, which means you think about it. You try to understand the effects that are going to be had, which you can't do very well because effects this affects that, which affects that, which affects that. And, you know, you can only do so much in your mind. You don't know how all these things are going to bounce. You just do your best. In other words, you don't approach it casually and go, well, what the hell, you know, I'll do that. That's not due diligence. You try, you decide what is best for everyone in the long term, then you do it. Then you look at the results and learn from it. That's how we progress forward. It's a mistake to get bound up in the problem of I don't know the right answer so I can't act because I don't want to do the wrong thing. Doing the wrong thing is the terrible, most terrible thing I can think of is doing it wrong. So I don't know what the right answer is so I can't do anything at all because I don't want to do it wrong. That's not a good way to act. That paralyzes you. You no longer can make choices because of your ignorance. Well, our ignorance is huge. If we stop making choices because we're ignorant, we would turn into rocks. We wouldn't make choices anymore. So you can't do that. You make your best choice, then you look back and see what happened. Was it a good choice or not? And if so, how could you have made it a better choice? What piece of data did you miss? What connection didn't you know? And if you can find something like that, then you'll learn. You grow up, your next choice will be better. But you may look back at it and say, well, that didn't work out so well, but I don't see how I could have done it any better because I just didn't have the information. Well, that's okay. You did the best you could. Things happened the way they happened. There's no fault in making the wrong choice. There is a fault in not learning from it if you could have learned from it. You see, so that's the way it is with all your choices. It's not a problem making a mistake. It's not a problem making a bad choice. It's only a problem making a bad choice and not learning from it. If you can learn from it. Sometimes it's hard to learn from it. Well, so you just do your best you can and go on. So they, in philosophy, they usually talk about this experiment, like if you could, if you could go back in time and kill Adolf Hitler when he was a child, mm -hmm. you know, would that be the right thing to do? Because that would sa that would save a lot of pain and suffering. So, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Well, 
it's very difficult to look at long-term entropy reduction. You may find that you know, killing Adolf Hitler in 1942 um, may or may not serve long-term entropy reduction. There's a lot of, I mean, we, it's very hard for us to, to, to decide those things. Now, you might think that's, a, that's really an easy decision to make because we know all the awful things that happened. But you don't know what else happened over the next 50 years after that because of that. Maybe there were a whole lot less wars after that because that one was so terrible. And if that one didn't happen, another 50 wars would have happened that all summed together would be worse. You see, you don't know these things. So I found it best to let things be the way they are. Unless I know enough for sure to, uh, to know that I should intervene, I tend to let it alone. But let's take a, another moral choice, an obvious choice, that will also point out that my, my philosophy is not a nonviolent. It's not a um, pacifist. pacifist philosophy. Okay, so let's say you are in a small village, back in a time when there were mostly small villages, and they often fought with each other. You're in a small village, and here's your home, and there's the next, and there's a whole bunch of homes that are kind of all in a row or in a circle or someplace, and maybe there's 20 of them. And you realize that the, your enemy that lives in the village next door, they've come into the hut that's two doors down from you, and they kill everybody. And then they come to the hut that's next to you, and they kill everybody. And you know the situation that what they want to do is kill everybody in the whole village because there's this antagonism there. Well, at this point, a nonviolent person would go, all right, I'm next. It's life. But a person should oppose that. You know, they should oppose that. So now we're, we're not... Both of these villages, we'll say, are kind of equal in their moral stature or whatever. It's not the good guys and the bad guys. It's just people and the way they are. So to stop something that is clearly high entropy, you not only can do it, but you have the, you know, you, you must do it as best you can. Okay, But that's something to see really clear. So we just made that up. So there was a clear thing there where we knew that, that we needed to intervene. So if you have a way to stop that murder from progressing, you should stop it, even if that requires violence. So there's times to stand up and fight, and there's times to turn the other cheek. And which one you do depends on your calculation about the outcome of a long-term entropy. And you just do that the best you can, let the chips fall where they may, Learn what you can go learn, go on with your life. So carrying around guilt because you made the wrong decision is dysfunctional. You often, most often, you don't have the information you need to make an optimal decision. Don't let that stop you from making decisions. Don't, don't feel like it's terrible if I make a bad decision. And that, your bad decision may hurt a lot of people. But you make the best one you can. Then you go forward. Don't carry guilt with you. You did the best you could. It worked out how it did. Now learn from it. So that's the way you deal with, with moral things. Make your choice. Let the chips fall where they may. Learn. Grow up. Make better choices next time. If you don't make choices, it's hard to grow up from learning because you don't learn much. All you're doing is avoiding your choices. So don't shy from hard choices. Go make them. Don't feel guilty if they turn out poorly. Learn from them and move on. But you need to do your due diligence, which means you need to, you need to go inside yourself and make sure that your reasons for doing what you do is because it's your best low entropy choice, not because that's what serves your own personal interests or that's what puffs up your own ego. 
or that's what puts dollars into your bank account. Those are all the wrong reasons. We'll go back to the first one. What was the yeah, first so one? Uh, primarily, how can you reverse mental health disorders? Uh, mental health disorders come in all sorts. Sometimes it's just the rule set. The, you know, there's lots of variations in the way a human body can come together. The way all those chromosomes work, the way all those chemicals squirt or don't squirt or do whatever they do, the way the cells divide. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. So somebody can just be, can just come up with dysfunctional brain chemistry or dysfunctional brain or part of a brain that doesn't work right. It's just part of the statistics. Again, all of those things take place with a random draw from the possibilities. And sometimes you get this possibility. It's not very likely, but you draw it. And that's some kind of disease or some kind of genetic problem or something else. So there's some organic things that are rule set based that come just out of the probabilities. And there is there's is something you can do about those in that you can be very, very nice and caring and understanding about the people who are just the way they are. And the way the world works is stuff happens and you get to deal with it. And sometimes that stuff that happens is you have somebody very close to you who has severe mental issues and then you have to deal with it. And if you deal with it with love and caring, then you can grow from it. If you deal with it poorly, then you, you de-evolve from it. So there are choices there. And if you happen to be the one that's, let's say, uh, uh, maybe severely retarded or whatever, there's things you can learn there too. There's still choices to be made and you will learn from those choices but you will probably create choices for hundreds of other people that will cause them to evolve or de-evolve. You see? So you can, though, change it in the sense that mind can move matter. You can make physical changes with intent, but there has to be uncertainty. There has to be wiggle room in the system to modify itself. Okay? If there's not much of that, then you can't be effective. Somebody breaks their arm. Now, here's their arm, and it's in two pieces. And you say, well, I intend that those two pieces, you know, become one piece again. Well, the probability is real low that these two bones are just going to pull apart and come together again without some intervention. So that's not something. But let's say you've got some sort of uh, issue with brain chemistry. Well, that's now a lot more uncertainty about that brain chemistry you may be able to shift that with intention, change that brain chemistry. Now, that's one set where you just, you just come in that way. Another set is where you create it yourself. That's the case where you feel a lot of stress and anxiety because you have fear. And let's, to make an example, say your fear is that you are inadequate. You're insecure, you're inadequate, you've got issues with abandonment or whatever else. And because of that, you tend to have a more, that fear creates ego, which creates problems in your life, which creates beliefs. You tend to be more negative because you're negative about yourself. And if you do that, you're likely to modify your brain chemistry to suppress neurotransmitters because your mind follow, your mind leads, your body follows, you're in a negative, grouchy, unpleasant mood most of the time. Your body chemistry will modify itself to support that. You know, well, that's not what you wanted to do, right? But that's what you do. And now you have to go take Prozac to get those neurotransmitters back in there where you actually created the problem yourself with a lot of negative thoughts about yourself, you see? So you can cure that by taking Prozac. You don't cure it, but you can fix the symptoms, or you can get rid of it altogether by getting rid of your fear. So that's one where it's self-created. And, and uh, then there's others where you happen to be gifted with getting information 
from other parts of the reality other than just this part. And everybody else thinks you're insane because you hear voices, you see pictures, and you get treated very badly because of that, because you're different. Whereas if people understood, you may become the medicine man, you know, in a different culture. You may become the seer, the person that they go talk to, to see maybe what choices they should make. So in that case, you just have a culture that doesn't understand and has a lot of fear, and they fear things that are different than they are. Anything different is scary. So then they label it as some sort of disease, give you drugs so that you become only semi-conscious and problem solved. You know, you get warehoused somewhere in an institution, probably. So that's just very unfortunate that your society is so close-minded that it cannot take you and discover your talents and your skills and your contribution because you're not like everybody else. That's, you know, unfortunate, but we live in societies like that. So mental illness can be all sorts of things. It can be self-created. It can be rule-set. It can just be an unfortunate interpretation of what a person's doing. Well, they're hearing voices, they must be crazy. Well, ask them, what about those voices, you know? Talk with the voice a while, uh, see what it's doing and why it's there. Connect with it. And uh, it may turn out to not be as nearly as crazy as it sounds. There may be purpose in that voice. But we don't do that because we define anything that's different than we are as being a problem. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Good question. Okay, so this question says, um, you say that all realities, including physical matter reality and non-physical matter reality, are information-based, where we receive a data stream. Are there any realities or reality that is not virtual? And is this where our individuated unit of consciousness lives? Well, yes, sort of. Um, the only thing that's fundamental is consciousness. Okay, everything else is virtual. And as I said before, if it's a reality in which you can experience, it's a virtual reality. Experience requires information. You can't have experience with no information. That's what information does. It, 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 that's your experience. So... They're all virtual realities if you can experience there. As consciousness, you can just be. You can be aware and not make choices. Just be awareness. And in that case, you are not experiencing. And you can exist like that, but it's not really a place where you grow. It's just a place where you are. And actually, everybody can experience that if you, if you uh, attain these states of point consciousness that I talk about. When you go to a state of point consciousness, you're aware that you exist and nothing else. It's a nice place to hang out in the sense that it's very relaxing. You come back more energized. So it's a nice place to be. Some Eastern uh, religions call that nirvana, where you are just in deep peace and relaxation, and the mind is totally blank. No experience. Your only experience is I am. So, yes, you can get into that, but just doing that isn't real. Uh, there's not a lot of consequences there. It's just an experience. So it's not a place that you grow up. It can be a place where you recharge. It can be a place where you see and understand bigger pictures, but it's not really a place where you make choices. If you're making choices, you're having experience. If you're having experience, it's virtual. Mm -hmm. So people have an idea, well, when I die here, suddenly I'll know all the mysteries of existence because I'll, once I throw off this 
dense mortal coil. I'll become a being of light and know everything. It's not like that. If you're dense, when you die, you're going to be dense afterwards. <clears throat> you don't get smart just by dying. <laughs> dying is not an educational exercise. So you will cease to be aware here. You will become aware in what I call the transition reality, another virtual reality created to help people make the transition from one reality to another reality. So that's just another virtual reality. Your dream reality is another virtual reality. Out of body is another virtual reality. They're all data stream driven. They're all ex experiential. They're all virtual. So that's, that's. Okay, that's good. No, thank yeah. you for that. I know there's two parts to the question. I'm gonna come back to the other part because we only have 18 minutes before lunch and three more questions. So my, uh, my question is, um, what are your thoughts on a grand unified theory equation and unifying theories of gravity and quantum mechanics? Well, those things all unify very nicely once you get to the uh, understanding that this is an information-based reality. Gravity is a part of the rule set. Okay. There are no such things as fields. Fields don't exist. There's just information. If I have a, a positive charge here and I have another positive charge here, and if this one's fixed and this one can move, or this one will move away because there'll be a repulsive force between the two charges. Okay. Force is real. Fields are not. It's not because there's an electric field that goes between these two charges delivering the force at this one, and nobody can ever measure an electric field. They can only measure force. So yes, there are meters called electric field measurers, and you can put it in there, but what it measures is a force, not a field. So it's just part of the rule set. Rule sets are equations. It's a mathematical rule set. So the rule set says that if I have a charge here and another one a distance r away, it's going to be q1, q2, you know, over the square of the distance is what's going to be this force. It's computed, and that's what you get if you have that charge there. So everything's computed. Gravity is the same way. Gravity, uh, you know, enables us to, it's a part of the rule set that enables the whole thing, obviously, to pull together. So we end up with suns and planets and all of that is very gravity centric. So it's a rule set. And the rule set has equations that define how it's applied to the virtual reality. So in World of Warcraft, they have gravity too. Your elf doesn't just float up out of the sky and neither do the rocks and water always runs downhill and so on because World of Warcraft has gravity. It's just part of the rule set. It's the way it's defined. So when you see the world as information, you understand that, that particles don't really exist. Information exists. The information has to do with, with uh, how particles interact with each other and what they do. It's computed, and science digs out the, the equations. It all fits together under one unified theory of science, if you will, but it actually fits in one unified theory of everything, including consciousness, including the, the, uh, the uh, non, well, including the subjective. There is such thing as subjective science. Uh, subjective science just requires statistics. Medicine is a subjective science in the sense that Here's a pill, and this pill cures headaches. Well, how do you prove that? It's not because you give it to one person and your headache goes away. You've got to give it to a 1,000 people and see how many of the headaches goes, goes away, and then you have a statistical e efficacy of it. So it only 
it only uh, relieves headaches in a statistical sense, not in a objective sense. It doesn't always work for everybody the same way. So anyway, gravity is just part of the rule set. The way quantum mechanics works, remember we talked about looking in the refrigerator and you get the random draw? Well, that works everywhere, including in quantum mechanics. Why, when those two particles, or the particles one at a time get at the slits and nobody's measuring what slit they went through, why do they distribute themselves? Because that probability distribution is a, looks like a diffraction pattern. And that's the random draw out of that distribution. That's why those particles line up like that in that diffraction pattern, because that's the probability distribution. Why is that the probability distribution? Because you need that, the system needs to use that probability distribution. Otherwise, there will be a logical conflict within the virtual reality between particles and waves. The system, one of its criteria is that there are no conflicts. So because there would be a conflict otherwise, it just simply makes that distribution the one that you do the random draw from because that solves the conflicts. So you see that same random draw from the possibilities and all of reality has to do with, with, uh, with probability. We live in a probabilistic reality. It's not computed from little particles up. It's not a bottoms up kind of thing. It's more of a top down probability model. But the rule set is predominantly deterministic mathematical. So everything then becomes part of this larger system. It's just the perspective that changes. So the perspective that information is the only thing that's real. Particles aren't real. Waves aren't real. It reminds me of uh, probably one of the best physicists in the 20th century was John Archibald Wheeler. John Archibald, Archibald, Bard, Archibald Wheeler said in his later years, when I first started out in physics, I was sure that everything was particles. And that's probably pretty much where we are now. We try to make everything particles. And he said, but I realized that that couldn't possibly be true. And then I was sure that everything was waves. <laughs> everything was uh, yeah, was uh, fields. That was his thing. Everything was fields. He says, and then I realized that that couldn't possibly be true. And then he realized that everything was information. And that's where he stopped. And he's the one that coined the little phrase, it from bit. It being the universe from bit being from information. And that's true. And science is going to develop that way. We start with particles. Newton, and then we went to uh, uh, the fields, and then we seem to go back to particles, and now we have particles and fields, you know, we have gravitational fields and electric fields and magnetic fields and electromagnetic fields and all sorts of other kinds of fields. We even have morphic fields. We have lots of different fields, but the fields don't really exist either. Fields are action at a distance. It's a way that scientists have come up with to try to make it easier to pretend that this is a physical reality. So you can say, oh, well, it's a field, and that field takes, brings the force there. But the field is invisible, can't be measured, can't smell it, can't hear it, can't touch it. It's an imaginary thing. It's a device. It's nothing but mathematics. Yes, the rule set is mathematical, and we can predict what a force is going to be in a particular place, but predicting it and causing it are two different things. We can predict it if we have the mathematics. I can predict where the sun will come up in the morning. I predict it will come up in the east tomorrow. You see, that's a prediction, but that doesn't mean I cause it to come up in the east. I'm just making a prediction. Well, that's what the mathematics of fields do. They make predictions. I predict there's going to be a force on this charge here at this time. Okay, So you make that prediction. Well, that prediction is right because that's part of the rule set. 
That's the way it works. That force will be there at that spot at that time. But it's not because there was some field that caused it. The mathematics of the field just predicts it. So you see, there really are no fields. There is no action at a distance. Even though I've got all these mics and they're all electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields and they radiate over there. It's all just rule set. Fields are the way that we explain it so that it appears to be physical. So that we don't have things just, forces just happen here at a time. They're caused by this field that propagates there. And yes, the delay time is the speed of light versus the distance covered because that's in the rule set too. Things take time to move. They can't move any faster than one delta x further delta t. So you have to, something's going to move. It can't move any faster than that. So that's part of the rule set. So it's all really is unified. And it's unified under the concept of this reality being information-based. Once kind of you get that, and it's easier to get that in your head than it is to really get it at a deeper level. But when you get that, you see that everything else then comes out of that overall understanding of reality and the rest of it uh, just derives out pretty easily. So that's what unifies all of those things. It's uh, information-based. And we're getting there quickly. When I first came out with my book in 2003, myself, Dr. Edward Predkin, another physicist, and um, probably Nick Bostrom were the only three people on the planet I know of that thought virtual reality was not insane. Everybody else was sure it was really a dumb idea. And today, you probably have 20, 30 percent of the physics department thinks it's, it's the wave of the future. It's where we're going to. I heard an interview in uh, CERN from a you know, the reporter talking about some CERN physicists back when they were looking for the God particle. Physicists have such drama in their, in their, st in their, their stuff. But anyway, and this guy was interviewing him, and he says, and well, what about these particles? And the guy interrupted and said, well, wait a minute. Really, they're not particles. He said, we no longer think of particles, of an electron. He said, we no longer think of an electron as a little chunk of mass with a charge. We used to think like that, but it didn't work out. We think of an electron as a point with the attributes of charge and the attributes of mass. That's how you would identify an electron in a simulation. It would be a point with attributes. So that's really the way physicists think about particles these days. But that doesn't keep them from being materialistic, even though they in their science, they can kind of fuzz between those two points. But anyway, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but, but really that viewpoint of, of information-based science is the grand, big, you know, theory of everything. Because with that, everything else is derivable. And it's a simple idea. What you'll find is once you get that idea, it's so simple. Everything falls out so nicely that it's hard to believe it isn't true. Although it's just a model. I don't claim any, any truth. Don't confuse reality with the model. It's just a model. But the model seems to really work well. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Sorry, that took a long time, but you know, you ask a physicist a question like that, you just, I can't help but give it a long answer. Uh, hi, Tom. I'm very grateful to be here. My name is Brian, and I'm not a physicist. Um, more of an intuitive, and I've been intuitively drawn the last 30 years to research ancient sites and specific points and how consciousness using frequency can manifest or change reality uh, a certain way. And uh, what my, my question is, is there's a raging debate that's going on uh, on the internet regarding frequency and concert pitch. And uh, knowing that the, the Monroe Institute, uh, Institute has really worked with frequency, uh, the, the, the foundation argument 
is that uh, frequency is completely arbitrary uh, in terms of our relationship to consciousness based on the fact that the, the second is completely arbitrary as our system of measurement. And uh, so I, I really wanted to just ask it, uh, about frequency, if you've noticed uh, in your studies uh, certain frequencies or, or pitches that enhance the experience and, and is all just a coincidence and arbitrary. And when you mean certain frequencies enhance, what, give me a little more detail on that. You mean like uh, acoustic? Or well, are you uh, thinking so something so non-physical? Metaphysical, because uh, right now there's a, a raging debate to close down uh, that a lot of people are having uh, transformations with a frequency known as 432 hertz uh, with their intent. And so the uh, uh, I can't kind of thing that it's all just metaphysical woo-woo. Yeah. Uh, and that's that, that experience they're having, that 432, is that a uh, uh, 432 hertz? Yeah. And it's an audio. Yeah, so the, the it's an audio frequency, right? right? So the okay. ar argument is that sound is just a, a, a air particle concussive coll a collision, and yeah. it's just all okay. This will probably not what you want to hear, <laughs> but <laughs> frequency really has nothing at all to do with it. Frequency isn't an issue. Frequency is a metaphor. Mm. Now. Having said that, metaphors can be very powerful. Mm. Okay, but that doesn't mean that it's that that's actually the mechanics of how things work. Okay, it also doesn't mean that certain sounds at various frequencies can affect mind. They can, mm. but we have we have this idea that consciousness and growth. You know, I guess it's kind of a new age idea has to do with frequency. As we grow up, we ascend to higher frequencies. And the physical world is the lowest kind of base course frequency. And we get the more subtle matter and higher frequencies, and that's our evolution. That's all metaphorical. It has really nothing to do with frequencies. And we talk about, well, matter. Everything vibrates. Everything's frequency. Atoms vibrate. Molecules vibrate. And that's all a model. Frequency isn't the point. Frequency is something that goes back and forth. Yeah. That's frequency. And it really doesn't have anything to do with anything at all. That's physical. So you to go back and forth requires a back and a forth, requires space. Consciousness doesn't have anything to do with space. There is no space in consciousness. You don't have consciousness with a lot of things going back and forth. That's a spatial concept. Hmm. So we take that spatial concept and we make it a metaphor, you know, because we tune in. I'll tune into your frequency and then we can communicate. It's all metaphorical. But metaphors have a lot of power. Metaphors can, can be tools that we use to focus our intent. See? So we have metaphors like when we heal people. I'm a light worker. I shine my bright white light on your dark evil spot and I make your dark evil spot go away. There is no light. There is no dark spot. These are all just metaphors. We use the metaphors. The light isn't really healing the dark spot. The dark spot's a metaphor for what's wrong with you. The light is a metaphor for some way for you to do something about that dark spot because we have this belief that if you don't do something, you can't have an effect. You don't have to do anything. It's not about doing. You see, so the, the, the whole vibration idea and frequency idea is a physical idea. It's an idea that comes out of the rule set of this physical reality. And as such, it has really nothing to do with consciousness. But yes, certain frequencies can be very helpful. A binaural beat of about four hertz will drive somebody into a theta state. It'll make their, their biology adjust in such a way that it gives their consciousness a whole lot more freedom mm -hmm. to do things. Yeah. You see? So yeah, it, that works. There are connections there. But it's not the concept of frequency that's driving any of it. Mm -hmm. That's all just metaphorical. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether you know that particular frequency is doing something, 
um, there is a there is a very strong effect. Of course, its 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 name is the placebo effect, but it's it's more than than what we normally just call the placebo effect. Your intent modifies future probability. The placebo effect is just one artifact of that. If you think that you know, uh, well, take take Dumbo the elephant. If you think that holding the little posy in your trunk will enable you to fly, it raises the probability of you being able to fly. It works, right? If you think that your lucky lucky coin or your your lucky stone that you carry around in your pocket makes your life better, it will, because the fact that you have it gives you a more positive outlook, which makes your life better. You see? So these things do work. It's not that they, they don't work, but if you really believe that you listen to a particular tone or an orchestra tunes to a particular way, that somehow that vibration interacts with your soul and you know helps you become enlightened, it doesn't work like that. But if you think that it does, that will help focus your intent, which will raise the probability that it does. So that's generally what's going on. So we have all kinds of healing modalities, all kinds of different charms and you know, who knows what, you know, remedies. You spray a little of this in the air and a little of that, and, you know, it helps raise your vibrations. All of that stuff works for some people if it helps them modify their intention on what it is they want. And it doesn't work for other people because it doesn't affect their intention. So the people that go, bah, humbug, that stuff couldn't work. Well, it doesn't. Well, it only works for me. It doesn't work for you. Well, if it works, it just works. It must be just in your imagination. Well, it is, yeah, but imagination is a really powerful thing. Yeah. yeah. And know? also the intent you use while you record the music regardless. Of Absolutely. Yeah. All the intentions, even the intention of the person who, who make, like you say, makes the music. Your intent when you record it. All of those intents add up. And if you get a whole lot of people sharing those intents, it becomes even more powerful. You know, if you and a hundred other people all put on the headphones and all go, oh, wow, yeah, that really does it. Some newbie comes in, he's probably got a very high probability that he's going to get the same thing because he's within a collective consciousness that's very positive on an effect. He'll pick some of that up, and he'll probably get the positive effect too. But the grouch that comes in and says, bah, humbug, all this stuff is nonsense, he'll put it on. He says, I didn't feel anything. You guys are all stupid. <laughs> you know? So you, you, with the 100th monkey syndrome type of thing, is you see that that's, that's collective consciousness. consciousness. Yeah, that's, that's a collective consciousness thing. That 100th monkey comes in and learns really fast yeah. because he picks up a lot of that learning from the other monkeys who have learned earlier. Mm. So he gets there, and just hanging out with all those monkeys that know things, he knows it a little more too. And because he's a monkey, he's not locked into his intellect He's more of a whole being connected at the being level to these other monkeys, and he'll pick it up a lot fa faster. If they did the hundredth human, it probably wouldn't have worked. The hundredth human would come in and say, well, I don't know anything. I can't do anything because the human would ignore all of that connection that it gets. It would force the information to come in through its intellect or it's not going to deal with it at all. And the human would just sit down and be stupid forever. Whereas the monkey <laughs> comes in and he becomes a part of that group. And he downloads from that group. So the hundredth human probably would fail where the hundredth monkey succeeds. Yeah. Because we tend to live in our, our heads too much. We're not whole people. We're not integrated with our being level and our intuition. And a monkey mm -hmm. would be. Yeah. They're not locked into that, that uh, intellectual viewpoint. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome.